Welcome. In case anyone's wondering what that was, I just thought it was kind of fun to put up there. That was the very first test card ever broadcast around the world. Uh, this is from, a, well, in the UK, this is a BBC. A test card was literally a card they held up in front of the camera so that when a technician came by to install your television in like a, oh, go away, little pop-up. When they came by to install your television in the 1930s, they would actually use this to verify that your television were working correctly and to calibrate everything. I thought they were kind of fun, which has nothing to do with the talk. I just liked it. Welcome to the Pearl Conference, which is not affiliated with O'Reilly Publishing. <laughs> so I chose to call this talk simply the Pearl Conference and not Yapsi. We don't have an official name of the Pearl Conference for this. I don't know what's necessarily going to be decided. But I decided, what the heck, I'm going to call it the Pearl Conference. And um, this is my second time in Cluj. Uh, I had a wonderful time here last time. Thank you very much for that, Evazon. And I was kind of curious, since we're going to be in Cluj again, I wanted to do a little bit of digging into the history. And I found this lovely piece of artwork on Wikipedia, which was Cluj um, almost exactly uh, 400 years ago. It's very interesting that down there, that middle thing down at the bottom says famous married couple. I guess that was the Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie of their day. On the far right, it says in Latin, a uh, famous virgin. I'm kind of glad I don't live back then. Um, but what I found really interesting was this little thing here. Um, it's, it's a long story, but basically this, is, this was painted this was Cluj, Napoca, the capital of Transylvania, painted by uh, Joris Hofnagel. I no, I pronounced that incorrectly. In no. s what she said. <laughs> actually, I sat with her last night, and they were, they were drilling me on how to actually pronounce the name, and I got it wrong every single time because I'm an American and my tongue just doesn't work that way. But this this was painted by uh, Joris in 1617, which I thought was absolutely fascinating because it means he painted this according to the legend down there, approximately 16 years after he died. <laughs> and I didn't want to come up here and have such an obvious Wikipedia flaw on my slide, and I did some digging around. You know, the answer was kind of obvious, you know, in retrospect, this capital of Transylvania. He was a vampire. <laughs> no, seriously, his uh, son was commissioned to re-release some of his works afterwards, and this was after his death, his son released this and a whole bunch of other stuff in a printed booklet, which is why the date is very strange, even though it says 1617 down there after his death. So it took me a while to dig that out, but it was kind of fun. It was interesting reading about the history. And I want to talk a little bit about history and how we actually got here, why we happen to be sitting in our seats right now. Now you can go out there, you can read Pearl Doc, Pearl Hist, which I did. This is one of the driest documents I've read in quite some time. It has lots of numbers and figures, and um, quite frankly, it's boring. It is a very boring document. It is about the Pearl language, and you know, you know all that. I didn't have to go through the dates about when it was released or little tidbits about them. Pearl doesn't mean anything without us, without the people sitting here, all of us in this room, and I want to talk about the Pearl community. In case you're wondering, that's uh, local hero Vlad the Impaler <laughs> explaining the new release system to the system administrators. <laughs> <laughs> no, I chose not to colorize that picture, but boy, that would have been fun. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> when we talk about community, what does community mean? Community is a lot of different things. It's very complicated, it's very difficult, we have lots of fights, uh, we have lots of agreements, disagreements, whatever. It's, it's a lot of different people and organizations and groups coming together to make a thing. And I just want to talk about those various things, because without those various things, Pearl wouldn't matter. So I sit on the board of the Pearl Foundation, so I'll just start talking about the Pearl Foundation first. I don't mention uh, Yapsi Europe Foundation here because I honestly, I've not had any involvement with them, so I don't know too much about them. My apologies for the oversight on that. But the Pearl Foundation. Most of you know we're a US nonprofit, which means most of you can donate money to them and not get a tax break for it. 
They were originally founded just for Yapsi. That, that was the entire purpose of the Pearl Foundation after a while, but as all bureaucracies do, they decided to acquire a bit more power. And it is grants for which they are primarily known uh, for most folks out there. So we have the Pearl 5 Core Maintenance Fund, which funds the work of you know David Mitchell, Nick Clark, uh, Tony Cook, others. Booking.com, by the way, it was announced at the last YAPSI in North America. They just put in another $100,000 into that fund to raise it to over half a million. For Pearl 6, we had the Ian Haig grant, which helped carry Pearl 6 development on for quite some time. Today, we have the Pearl 6 development fund, which that's uh, primarily for Jonathan Worthington right now. He's the one doing a lot of development on that. I think that's only had 45,000 in it. I, I can't remember the exact amount on that, but that, that's part of what's being done there. Uh, and then there's general grants given out every two months. You can go out to the blog and see the grant reports, you can see the grant proposals, people can comment on them, you know, what they like, what they don't like, and then the grant committee listens to that and, you know, figures out what grants are going to award. But that's not all the Pearl Foundation does. We do things like, you know, funding workshops and conferences when they can. Uh, obviously, they don't have unlimited amounts of money, but many times conferences talk to the Pearl Foundation, hey, can you help us out? Sure. Or, you know, little workshops can be helped out from time to time. They also do Trademarks, uh, dealing with trademarks and intellectual property. This is incredibly boring stuff to most people, um, such as me. But nonetheless, there's a lot of stuff we, we didn't say publicly because as any lawyer will tell you, you have to be very careful about your communication if you have an open court case and it's not settled. So in Japan, when some group thought it would be cute to trademark the word pearl, the Japanese Pearl Association worked with the Pearl Foundation to overturn this trademark. This would have made life for Pearl very interesting in Japan. And that was announced on the blog after it was long done. We had discussions about this in the board many times before that, trying to figure out what to do. And it wasn't a fun situation having to deal with what appeared to me at least to be an opportunistic group. But that got done, and most of the community doesn't know about that. But that's just part of what we do. We're involved in community advocacy. And for this, we mean the entire Pearl community, all of the, all of the Pearl 5, Pearl 6 community, trying to get involved in all of that. It's a very broad scope, just trying to support Pearl and the community in general. We also do marketing and public relations poorly, but we do them. And the one thing I can say is on y soit qui me le pense, which is old French for shame of you who thinks poorly about it, because some people sometimes gripe about this, but I see a lot of volunteers going to the Pearl Foundation and work really hard and they don't get any recognition for it. And I feel a little self-serving saying that. I apologize, because I'm on the board. But these are people who really work hard trying to help you, and they don't get a lot of recognition. So I appreciate the fact that they are there and helping us maintaining our websites and stuff. But enough of that, enough of that. Community, let's get back to the community. Some of the first bits of community that we had for pearls back in the uh, Complaining Pearl days, which was started in 1989. If you go out to Google Groups today, you can actually read um, all the posts for Complaining Pearl going back a long time, and you'll recognize many of the names on that list. Back then, are still very act some are very active in the Pearl community today, some less so. Back then, patches were just sent to the list. You didn't have get, you know, check out Pearl, patch it up, you know, make a pull request or anything like that. They just sent a patch to the list. Oh, I've got this fix for this particular function, and invariably Larry would come back and say, no, you don't. And then he would fix their fix, and things would move forward. And it was nice. It was interesting seeing that birth of the Pearl community through Complaining Pearl. This is back when news groups were extremely popular. Uh, and that ended maybe around 2005. That's very hard to say because Complaining Pearl wasn't delisted everywhere, and people still try and post to it from time to time. But those days are pretty much gone. Pearlmongers. We had the New York Pearlmongers, Mungers, Maniacs, whatever the heck they were. Um, they were founded in 97, and then in 1998, Brian Foy officially created uh, Pearlmongers, and they spread very quickly and eventually were absorbed by TPF in 2000, because that's what TPF likes to do and lots of Pearlmonger groups around the world, and that was a lot of the community. So much, so much activity on different mailing lists, I can't keep up with all of them, and I, I stopped a long time ago because there's simply too much. 
And they're interesting because I remember, for example, Portland Pearlmongers was dead. And when I took it over, the group came back to life. We started having regular meetings. And just one person can go in and make a huge difference in just that small way by getting people together, getting them to talk about the language, have some fun, sharing techniques. Again, that's part of community. And I watch this happen in Pearlmonger groups all over the world. And then there was Pearl Monks. Any of you folks still regularly visit Pearl Monks? There's a few of you out there. That was created back in uh, 1999. Uh, you folks uh, who know Pearl Monks, you might remember uh, the name Tim Vroom? Yeah, he's still around. He actually, he works for ZipRecruiter now. He's still hacking Pearl. He's still out there. Uh, not as public anymore, but he's still there. And they became part of Pearl Foundation in, I couldn't find the exact year, and I wasn't too worried about it. That incidentally is where the name Ovid comes from. People keep asking me, where did you get the name Ovid? And when I signed up for Pearl Monks, I was reading a lot of poetry, and my two favorite poets were Ovid and John Davidson. And boy, would it have been interesting if I had chosen the username John Davidson. <laughs> for those of you who are curious, John Davidson, the Scottish poet, not the Milk Coast uh, Broadway actor who's out there today. And then there's Enlightened Pearl Organization. Now, they're very interesting. They were, they were founded in 2008. And instead of trying to serve the Pearl community as a whole, they said, let's focus on Modern Pearl. Modern Pearl is where it's at. Modern Pearl is really exciting. Because Modern Pearl, you can do great things with Modern Pearl. And when you get back to a legacy system, oh, it's such a sigh of relief to get back into a Modern Pearl world. And so that's what they focus on. And they do lots of work. They, they fully sponsor Strawberry Pearl and the servers. There's all sorts of projects they support, Meta CPAN, CPAN testers. Uh, they were doing Send a Newbie for quite some time. I think they'll still be doing it, uh, just not this conference. Uh, supporting the Pearl QA Hackathon. I was at the first five of those, and then I had to miss some because trying to take care of visa troubles in France is very fascinating. France likes to treat bureaucracy as performance art, so. Sorry about missing some of those hackathons, but we have a lot of hackathons. So the Pearl QA hackathon is one that I really enjoyed. Moving to Moose, Copenhagen, the Pearl 6 hackathon, all sorts of different hackathons, and workshop after workshop after workshop after workshop. I mean, <laughs> yes, Theo. Sorry, a little in-joke there. You love it when I do in-jokes up here, and all of you are like, what? So the Pearl community is just thriving, absolutely thriving. We're doing well. By the way, some people, uh, if you're not very familiar with conferences, if you don't show up at events like this a lot, people ask, what's the difference between a workshop and a hackathon? And in a workshop, you know, you still have, it's like a mini YAPSI or mini Pearl conference. You still have talks. Hackathon is a little bit different. Sorry, didn't think it was appropriate to say that out loud. But. We're actually here at the Pearl Conference. So let's, let, let's talk about that a little bit. <laughs> so <laughs> it was first started back in 1999 when the moon was blown out of the Earth's orbit. <laughs> By the way, in case anyone's curious, um, for it, if on the off chance any of you don't get the reference, this is from Space 1999. All episodes are available for free on YouTube. And they were, yeah, uh, yeah, see, uh, Space 1999 was famous for extravagant production values and very poor scientific values. Asimov even took them to task for, oh my goodness, you are just miserable. And they actually made comments in the TV series about how odd it was their situation was because they acknowledged it was kind of rubbish. But it was fun. It's cheesy 1970s science fiction. So, Pearl Conference. O'Reilly actually held the first, first Pearl Conference back in 1977. And then Kevin Lenzo, in 99, decided he was going to have a special Pearl Conference, not so corporate, not so pricey, but he couldn't call it the Pearl Conference, so he called it YAPSI, yet another Pearl Conference. Uh, coincidentally, the very same year, because he couldn't have the name the Pearl Conference, O'Reilly decided to stop using the name the Pearl Conference. And then in 2016, O'Reilly said, OK, you can use the name Pearl Conference. Though I will say this, why didn't O'Reilly let us use the words Pearl, the Pearl Conference before this? Yeah, we didn't ask. <laughs> O'Reilly's pretty cool. They don't have a problem with it. If we had just bothered to ask, we would have been the Pearl Conference a long time ago. <laughs> so, yeah, on y soit que me le pense. The Pearl Conference.
Pro Conference. Why do we want to call it the Pro Conference? Why do I want to call it the Pro Conference? Not everyone agrees with this because we are a community. Some people do disagree. But first of all, it's an easier sell to your boss. I used to be in sales. I sold cars. One of the things you don't want your customers to do when you sell is to ask you questions. Because <laughs> anytime they ask questions, there, there's doubt, there's uncertainty, you're, you're getting derailed from the purpose of, you know, please give me your money. So you go to your boss. Do you like the work I'm doing? Yeah. You want me to learn more? Yeah. Can I go to Yapsi? What's that? <laughs> yeah. Um, from a sales standpoint, <laughs> that is not the best strategy. Do you like what I'm doing? Yeah. Do uh, you want me to learn more? Yeah. Can I go to the Pro Conference? Yeah. They, they know what the Pearl Conference is. There's no question about that. The words the Pearl Conference are pretty darn clear. Yapsi is kind of like a big in-joke with all of us that the rest of the world just looks at us and goes, huh? You know, if we're lucky. So it's also... The best <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll debate that later. Yep. So it's also much better for SEO. Um, out on the web, you know, people are looking for the word Pearl for some reason. They're not going to find it if you talk about what a great time you had at Yapsi. So it's a really nice thing if we start going out there and we're tweeting and blogging about, we were at the Pearl Conference. So we can reclaim this name and we can get people knowing that we're still as vibrant as we know we are, but the rest of the world doesn't because I don't see it quite as much. So this is a great thing. And it turns out there's community support for this. Again, not all, but at the last Yapsi, there was a survey taken of attendees and most people either agreed with the idea or didn't have an objection to it. Very few people said no. But a nice thing is sponsors. So here, it's an easier sell to sponsors. If you go, anyone who's ever run any sort of conference before can tell you all about the financial woes. They're not fun. Sponsors help with this tremendously. In fact, so if you go to a local business, and this business has a whole bunch of pro programmers and you're holding a Yapsi there. Hey, you know, you're pro programmers, you want them to learn more, you want more people to know about what your company does, you want to get some, you know, inexpensive advertising for the sort of people who deal with the sort of technology you deal with. Yeah. So you want to sponsor Yapsi? What's that? You know, once again, you set people up for this little stumble in the conversation. You don't want to do that. You want people to say, Yes, so you say, you want to sponsor the Pro Conference? There's no question on their minds of what it is. So I mean, again, it's a multiple, multiple benefits all over the place. And the nice thing is once you get the sponsors, this can cut the price of a ticket in half, which makes it easier, point number one, the easier sell to your boss to go through because you're paying, he's, he or she is paying less for your ticket than they would otherwise. And in fact, I like the idea of ditching the name Yapsi so much and going for the Pro Conference. I even have a, icon or a symbol that we should adopt for it. <laughs> okay, I'll, you can ask me for the graphic later if you want to. So speaking of sponsors, sponsors are part of our community. We, we sometimes don't think about that. We think of the community as groups of individuals, but it's also groups of groups. And so the sponsors for this conference, cPanel, um, they're the most popular web hosting control panel, and I think it's estimated that once every six seconds a new website is launched with the cPanel uh, control panel written in Perl. We are still the duct tape of the internet. Booking.com, insane amounts of traffic. I think last I saw, they were like the world's fourth largest e-commerce site after Alibaba, Amazon, and eBay. So huge, driven almost entirely with Perl. Um, <coughs> and of course, Evazone. Uh, many of you folks were at their party last night. They're a local consulting firm. They do a lot of work in Perl, uh, including brand new projects done in Perl. We also have Perl, Perl Careers, Capside, Eligo Recruitment. Uh, I think everyone knows Rick at this point. <laughs> Lots of other sponsors. I'm not going to go over all the names right now, but these are the people who helped to make this conference possible, who helped to make you, helped to bring you here, keep the prices reasonable so we can continue to do this. And they're here for one of two reasons. They're here to either sell you something because they think their services might be interesting to you or they want to hire you, which is, you know, give you money or take money from you in some way, shape or form. But they are also part of the community and they're an important part. 
So what you should do during this conference is find the people who are involved with these sponsors and ask them, why are you here? Why are you part of the community? What's your interest? Because they are really important. And please, oh, everyone give a hand for the sponsors. They help make it. talk about Pearl 5 for just a moment and some of the interesting things I'm seeing here as we're just talking about history and meandering along and Pearl 5 was interesting because okay so yeah it introduced strict modularity so you could start building bigger systems a lot easier it had objects it was kind of a simplistic object system that was nonetheless extremely flexible sometimes overly flexible sometimes not flexible enough in the ways that we wanted it to be but you could get stuff done and Pearl 5 was interesting. And I remember back when I was first hacking on Pearl, you know, this was a very, very sophisticated software stack. CGIPM, DBI, HTML, Mazer. I mean, you had those things on your CV, you had a job. It was pretty simple. Modern Pearl is a little bit different. So Catalyst or Dancer 2 or Mojalicious, you have DBX class, the ORM, which is generally the most popular, Moose. Pearl 6 is also, in my mind, part of modern Pearl. It's a separate part of the Pearl family, and this is something that I think the Pearl community is going to be getting more used to. From now on, we are going to have two different Pearls as part of the same family. We're going to be getting used to them. Each is going to be borrowing ideas from the other. But what has really helped Pearl in many ways in the past few years is Moose. And I think Moose is so fascinating, um, particularly if you really get into studying object-oriented programming and some of the benefits about it. What what has made Moose great? So when I wrote Beginning Pearl, a lot of my reviewers said, actually, your first object-oriented chapter should be about Moose, not about blessing a reference. And I was trying to focus on people being able to maintain legacy code and existing systems. So I put the references first. But today, when I interview developers, many of them know object-oriented code with Moose, or Moo, or Mo, or M, or any of the multiple variants. And blessing a reference, not a clue. I've been rather surprised about that. Moose has won. And how did it win? That's, that's what's really interesting about this. So actually, it turns out the moose does not have antlers. That is the cordyceps mind control fungi. <laughs> so that's how moose actually won. Moose and Perl developers are nothing more than a vector for the cordyceps to reproduce. So I had a lot of fun creating that slide, I might add. <laughs> oh, look at that. I guess stand here and just do that for an hour. It was fun. <clears throat> so Moose, we had clean object-oriented code in a way that when you adopt Moose, if you compare our OO to other dynamic languages, we blow them out of the water. It is so much nicer. It is so much easier to see what's going on. There is so much power available with that, particularly when you start uh, adopting the types which are available. It's not a type system, but it is really, really nice. The MOP is fantastic. That allows us to leapfrog so many other languages. But the reality is Moo is incredibly popular because most people don't use the mop that much. I think roles might be part of what is so fantastic about it. I, I could talk about roles quite at length. Roles are the most exciting thing to happen to object-oriented programming since the release of Simula 67 50 years ago. They are incredible. They are wonderful. You had classes, polymorphism, encapsulation, and inheritance introduced back then. And inheritance, they've all, it's always been a bit of a sticky wicket for it. And roles aren't perfect, but they are just phenomenal. And they're part of the reason why I go into shops today, and they're using Moose, and they're using roles all over the place. It's part of the reason why Moose has dominated. And Moose has helped us in other ways. So for those days uh, when we used to bless a reference, there would be recommendations to, hey, that doesn't work on this screen. OK, there used to be recommendations to have a leading underscore before the attribute name. Can anyone, anyone remember why that was? Private? Yeah, because if you're going to reach inside the object, you should know which things you can play with and which things you can't. New, no, new. No. Yes, it was for private attributes. Today, we know you just don't reach inside the darn thing. This is awful. But back then, we thought it was acceptable practice, so we did that all the time. But now, Perl devs know better. We understand OO code better. We're understanding more and more why immutability is such a great thing for objects and why it's so powerful. 
we understand better what single responsibility means for a class. And a lot of this, of course, has bled over into Perl 6. Perl 6, oh, just phenomenal. You play with Perl 6, it's just awesome. And you, you know the history of Perl 6. Back in 2000, a mug was broken, and then Moses led the Jews to the wilderness for 40 years. <laughs> And in a cruel twist of fate, drop them off in the Middle East in the one place without oil. <laughs> so boy, is that testing their faith or what? And then Christmas arrived. Oh my goodness, Christmas was wonderful. Uh, yeah, not him. But Christmas was wonderful. It was this feature stable release. And this is the go-to slide that I use when I talk to non-Pearl developers about Pearl 6. Now, here's a few things interesting, first of all. There are, from what I've seen, two groups of people extremely hostile to Perl 6. And I find it fascinating. One is the people who, the word Perl, no, no, no. These tend to be older programmers who saw the horror of Perl 5 legacy code. And people who are just unremittently hostile to Perl, Perl 6, they don't even want to think about it. The other group that seems to be unremittingly hostile to Perl is old school Perl 5 developers who love Perl 5 so much. So the people who really love Perl 5 and the people who really hate Perl 5 have gotten to bed together to hate Perl 6, <laughs> which I find fascinating. <laughs> Aside from them, when I'm talking to people about Perl 6, so on the left hand side, that's the Perl 6 code for one way of representing a simple XY point class. And that's the Java code on the right side. I use this particular example because I don't have to explain a lot. Um, I don't really have to explain like infinite lazy lists or anything like that. It's simple declarative demonstration of the power of the language and the Java code on the right side. I had to shrink the font down a little bit, but what's really fascinating is even if you substitute that with Ruby or Python and you try and get the same functionality, it's not that much shorter. Perl 6 is incredibly expressive and it's declarative. There's no procedural code in the Perl 6 example. But even more than that, when I'm talking to them, you know, you've got math that works, you've got the meta object protocol, it's built in, oh my goodness, we need this for Perl 5, where's Steven? You have composable concurrency, gradual typing, there's so many things about Perl 6 which are interesting. And what's really great is when I talk to people and they say, oh my goodness, I really want that. They're not talking about, I want that one thing. There are so many languages or frameworks or whatever out there, and they're a one or two trick pony. They just, okay, they've got that one thing that people really want, and Perl 6, it scratches so many, so many different people's itches, but really different itches. It is different things that people want about it. The general level of excitement isn't about this one thing, which might be a fad that goes away tomorrow. So of course, Perl 6 had a feature stable release. There's more modules getting into the ecosystem all the time. Uh, people are beginning to regularly blog about it. We're seeing conference tutorials. Uh, Jeff Goff did one yesterday. It is just awesome. And for many of us, it's the future. So let's talk about Perl 5 today. That's what a lot of us are here about. That's what a lot of us are wondering about. So Gartner, in their IT market clock for programming languages, Perl will remain a solid technology investment because they know that they've done a lot of research and they've seen what companies are actually using. Pearl's here to stay. They're not worried about this. And they're paid to get things right. Gartner's really good about that. And I know a lot of people hate on Tyobe, and I don't understand why. You can misunderstand what Tyobe's saying. But for those who aren't familiar with the Tyobe index, what they do is they take the 25 of the most popular search engines for which they can reliably parse the information out of it and they aggregate how much people talk about different programming languages. And Perl, right now, this was, uh, I think this was uh, August, something close to that. Perl's number nine, solidly in the top 10 of hundreds of programming languages, as it has been for years. And then, also another thing, by the way, in case you ever hear this, I've heard this a few times, that the gentleman who created Tyobe has a well-known bias against Perl, and that's a pretty strong statement. I've asked for evidence, and no one has ever given me a single shred of evidence for that. So if you can, please, I would like to see that. So I was also looking at this graph. Now this one was really interesting because actually, from about 2010 on, the levels mostly remain the same. So we had a little dip in 2014, and then Pearl's starting to trend upwards slightly. 
we're down from the heyday of the early 2000s, obviously the late 90s were the best, but Pearl, at least for the buzz, has remained stable, and there's a slight uptick from the low point in 2004. And then I look at Indeed.com, and you can see that Pearl, mostly, the trend line is stable, not the sort of decline we had for about 2015, 2016. And then the active state 2016 Pearl survey, you know, of course, I know CPAN still a strength, community is wonderful. Half of the developers they surveyed had been in Pearl five years or less. These are new Pearl developers coming in. They, they were surprised. It was awesome. So that, that was something which I think is really interesting. And then my company, we do Pearl consulting. We go in, we build systems, we train people on Pearl. And when we started this, I was expecting that we were going to be doing a lot of legacy work with Pearl. That's what I thought. And so I wrote blog articles about it. I was talking to people about this. I was letting them know here is a good, stable way of transforming a legacy system into a more modern system. Uh, no, people were coming to us with, we need these new systems built in Pearl. And in fact, at least one manager, I was talking to him and asked him, why did your company decide to go with Pearl instead of this other technology you had evaluated? And he told me, we're tired of being bitten by hype. <laughs> so why did they go with Pearl? Because it's battle tested. Everything they've thrown at us, we're still here, we're still strong. And the Pearl community has stabilized, particularly the past couple of years. Jobs are looking good. They're doing well. I'm seeing more companies choosing Pearl as their go-to language because, again, they're tired of the hype. Because we've been here. We have the tools. We have the community. And it's in the past two years we finally seem to have hit that equilibrium from those long years wandering through the desert or whatever. We are doing well. And we have found a new point, which isn't quite the heyday of the late 1990s, but that's impossible to reach because we didn't have a lot of competition actively involved in that space. Now that we do, we're doing well. And I'm really, really happy to see this. And part of what is gonna help us continue to do well is to keep doing what we've been doing, talking positively about Pearl. And when you start blogging about it or tweeting about it, tell people about the great time you had at the Pearl conference. So, I want to thank all of you for being here at the Pearl Conference, and I really look forward to chatting with some of you over the next few days. Thank you. Yes, I know. Apparently that was, once again, shorter than it should be. So what, do you want me to talk? I can fill time. Does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, we can go have our coffee break. It's your choice. Yes. Um, one of the reasons that uh, Pearl is so low on the Toyota index is because uh, people insist on writing about Pearl instead of, the, instead of writing about the Pearl programming language. So Toyota looks at Pearl programming language, not at the word Pearl. Okay, that I, I don't know about. I don't know exactly how they uh, grab all their metrics. Oh. Uh, she was saying that part of the reason why Perl doesn't do better on the tie-up matrix is because they're looking for the words Perl programming language and not just Perl. That could be to normalize it against others, because if you look for Ruby, you might get a lot of false positives. So, yes? He was saying part of the reason why C is at the top of the list and not so much Pearl is because so much of the traffic is pe people looking to solve their problems on the web, which might explain why COBOL doesn't show up, even though it is still the most popular programming language in the world. But I also don't want to make comparisons between Pearl and COBOL because that might be a really awkward turn at this point. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, 
Uh, yes, Stack Overflow is going to trend towards the younger audience and the sort of stuff that's more likely to be uh, open source. So I know Perl wins. Uh, so Stack Overflow is not doing as Perl's not doing as well on Stack Overflow compared to other languages because not as many people are asking the questions there. Um, and you know the question is why? Is it because it's not as popular? Are they finding you know local community members who can help them out? Can they turn to their colleagues and their colleagues can answer this for them quickly? I, I don't know. I can't say. I do know for GitHub, Perl is doing well compared to a lot of the languages below it in the Tyobe index, but also a large part of that at one point was Schwern pushing all of the CPAN onto GitHub, which kind of artificially inflated our numbers a bit. But when you start trading, checking activity on GitHub, uh, Perl's not as popular there, but it's still remaining very solid, very strong. Anything else? Yes. Oh, okay. Conspiracy, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, so are you saying that uh, Perlmongers joined TPF in 2000 at the same time, or Perlmongers joined TPF in 2000 at the same time as Perlmongers? I didn't know the exact year, so thank you. Anything else? Yes. I don't think so because of the culture of the people who are here. So the concern in case folks didn't hear about it or in case it doesn't get picked up in the mic is, you know, originally the Pearl Conference with uh, O'Reilly, 97, whatever, 97, 98, was perceived as being extremely corporate, filled with sponsors everywhere, and not really a, a human event, whereas YAPSI has been historically. And the concern is switching the name to the Pearl Conference and being so welcoming to sponsors. Are we going to have that problem? I don't think so. Um, O'Reilly is, they're focused on a different market. They have different goals and what they were trying to do isn't what we try to do with the Pearl Conference or YAPSI. That one gets a little tricky trying to <laughs> use that term there. Uh, I don't think that's going to be a problem. I know that the sponsors understand the nature of this event and they're fairly happy with this. Um, I do know it was asked at the last YAPSI on the survey, um, would you support paying twice as much for your ticket and doing away with sponsorship? And overwhelmingly people said no. No. We want the sponsors. And the community said, we want the sponsors. And they're happy to have the sponsors here. And, you know, they're actually nice folks, and they've got some interesting stories to talk about. So I, I've met quite a number of them, and I strongly encourage you to do so, because they help us out, and they're also part of the community. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, OSCON Europe is actually a lot nicer, I think, than OSCON US. Uh, they had it last year in Amsterdam. I will be there in London this year if anyone's interested in going to OSCON Europe. Uh, so they didn't accept a lot of Pearl Talks. I pitched a talk called Testing Lies. Little do they know, I slipped a Pearl Talk into OSCON. So. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's a lot, it's at least the Amsterdam one last year, which much smaller, uh, you still had a bit of a corporate vibe. It certainly wasn't this community feeling you have here, because here, a lot of us know each other. Uh, I know sometimes people say, oh, you've got all these people who've been around for a long time, they're talking to each other, they're not talking to new folks. Well, we want to talk to the new folks, but also, I've got a lot of friends here. So we've got this cohesiveness, these people that I know, I just greet with a hug, and just nice people that I've known for years. But OSCON, you can't have that because there's so many different communities being represented under one roof at the same time. So it does change the nature of that in a way that I don't think we would ever have to worry about. Uh, and if we did, that might mean we're so incredibly successful that we've got um, nice problems to worry about. Anything else? Go get coffee. <laughs>